Well, why it's been a couple weeks since I've been been here and able to teach, and last week was just a couple days after uh, we saw some really terrible stuff happening in the world. Right? It's been about ten days since Hamas went into Israel and just attacked and, and murdered a lot of people. Some of the worst reports detailed young women being dragged, like kidnapped, out of their homes and then kidnapped and, and raped. Uh, there, of course, was that account of the babies that were just murdered in their bed. And, and just a level of brutality that, as I'm, I'm hearing the report, and I was out of, uh, out of cell phone service for days. So I, I get back into cell phone service, and then I'm just starting to hear all these reports after reports of what was happening and how it happened. And it, it is it's hard to believe how people can act in such a way. And yet we know how that happens. It's possible because of sin. You know, and, and I, I think about how Old Testament judges felt entering the wicked lands of their enemies, or even how Paul felt when he entered into different Roman cities that were just wicked and corrupt and evil in, in different manners and different ways. And how is it possible for, for sin to be that rampant? And last week, Zach Hayes was here. I'm real grateful for him teaching um, in my absence. And he talked about that. He talked about the, the anatomy of sin. And how sin, just a little bit of sin in someone's life or in a culture that's allowed to stay there and remain will spread. Sin is never content to stay put within its, its boundaries. It, it spreads, and, and the goal of sin is to bring death. Wayne Grudem defines sin like this. He says, sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. I like that definition. I don't like what it's defining, but I think it's accurate. And, and what Zach talked about a little bit last week, and what we know just because we live in the world that we live in, and I hope you're a Christian, I hope you, you've come to understand that we are, we have sinned, right? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we, we live in this culture where we just see sin as rampant and on TV and, and just broadcasts like that. And the question I want to ask tonight a little bit is how do we respond to that sin? How do we respond to the sin of what's happening currently in the Middle East? But even in our, our world, right? That, that's our world, but it's not our world, right? How do we respond to the sin that we see in our community? How do we respond to our sin? And, and I do think there's some responses that we want to take. So there's the, of course, the response, do we ignore it? And, and you can ignore what's happening in the Middle East. You could just put on some other distraction, some other movie or some other podcast, or you, you just turn off that, those outlets. And you could, I think, successfully ignore that. But more locally, it's hard to ignore the sin of our community, the the more issues of direct rebellion that we see in just down the streets here. Whether that's, uh, like, we have in our own backyard uh, abortion factories. We have in our backyard people who are dealing with the fentanyl epidemic and the, the crisis. And you guys have seen those videos and the pictures. And, and homelessness here, I don't think homelessness we can direct say is a direct sin, like, like not every person that's dealing with homelessness is there because of, of their direct sin. Although, I, I do believe it's fair to say a large amount of them have made some really poor decisions that have put them in that place. This mic's a little closer to my beard than normal, so forgive me. Um, but, regardless, it's hard to ignore that stuff. Even if you turn off the news from what's happening in the Middle East, it's hard to ignore other types of sin that are just blatant in all types of, of media nowadays that we see. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I might switch mics in a minute. So one, one thing that I don't know if you want to do, I know that part of me is like, man, it'd just be nice to, to look the other way with all this. 
feel the violence stop. Another response is, is just to, to run to the hills, right? That this whole idea, I don't know how many of you daydream of this, where you get a, a big fat piece of land and you, you build fences up and just you and your people come and you, you have uh, all the storehouses you need, you buy all the firearms you need. I, like, you can see why I, I would like dreaming about some stuff like this. And then you just, you know, outlast the storm. It'll be all, we're, we're gonna be good in our community, in the hills until everything passes. And that, that's one response that, I, frankly, a lot of people I think are trying to do. They don't go to those extremes, but they, they flee from areas that are uncomfortable or where they, just where they can be a little bit more separate from a lot of the issues that we're facing nowadays. They, they run to the hill, hills. Now that's enticing, but that's not right either. Well, what about this? One response is, man, the, world, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. It's just a ticking time bomb. It's going to find us anyways. There's no hope. So our response can be, let's just have, like, let's get our own. Let's get our fun. Let's get it. Let's make sure we get what we want out of this world until, while well, we can. Because when the bomb goes off, you know, it is what it is. There's no hope. But might as well just have fun until the apocalypse comes. Like we, have you guys ever daydreamed about any of those or, or considered or wanted any of that, those responses? And I bring those up because on a large scale, when we think about what's happening in Israel or Ukraine and Russia or all, I mean, you name it, these national, big, international crises, we can respond in one way. I'm curious, I don't know, but I'm curious if our go-to response for those big things is suddenly our response for our personal sin as well. If the idea of ignoring the big stuff, because that stuff's easier to ignore, it's not as pressing, but then does that mean that we tend, we lean towards ignoring also the junk in our lives, that the sin, the destructive, the, the stuff that we, we don't like? But what is our response? How, what is the answer for all that? And the truth is we've been given the answer. The answer at, at, from a 10,000 foot view is the gospel. The answer is the gospel. The gospel is a hope for the world. But what I'm wondering also is how easy it is for us as Christians to hear that and, and to write that off. How many of you have any more hope after I said the answer is the gospel than you had 60 seconds ago before I said it? This idea that the answer or the hope of the world is the gospel doesn't affect us as Christians, I believe, to the, the degree that it should affect us. It doesn't give us hope the way that I believe it should give us hope. And where does that come from? What, it, does that come from a lack of understanding of what the gospel is? It, does it come from us understanding that we're thinking the gospel's too narrow or too small? Like it's too narrow, it's only for a certain, certain group of people or it's too small, it's only for a certain type of people? I think about in the Bible, there's the sons of Zebedee who wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans. Because Jesus was there for the Jews, definitely not the Samaritans. No way could he save them. Or I think about Jonah, who didn't want to go and spread the good news uh, of the Lord to the Ninevites. Because not them, they're terrible, they're wicked. Like, surely not the Ninevites. Do, do we do that? Do we consider that in, in the sin in our world, or the sin in our community, or the sin in our lives, that we think that... The gospel doesn't reach that far. What if, do we think it's just too small? Like the guys who, when they heard the apostle Paul got saved, they're like, mm, is he really saved? I'm not sure about that guy. How often, or, or to what degree, does that understanding infiltrate how we respond to our sin? But the, the gospel is the good news. It means good news. I'm just gonna keep that up, the loud snapping. It'll keep you all awake, you know? Yeah. The gospel is a pronouncement of the good news. How do you respond to good news? 
Yay, I like it. How, like, think about that. In fact, think about the last piece of good news that you received. How do you respond to it? Is it like, yay, Lord said yay. I don't, I'm not sure, I, there's some, I've received a lot of good news. I think about the times that I've received like I'm having a new kid. Mostly great responses, you know. There's been a few where it's like, wow, wow, <laughs> like, that's coming. Uh, we did that. Uh, but uh, you think about the other responses of, of different, I thought of some stupid things, like uh, good news of, of people winning different sports events, or I, I don't know, just silly stuff like that. <laughs> this past Wednesday, Neil Hoffman was at a fundraiser, and he started talking to a guy about Christianity, and he realized the guy had never given his life to him. And he starts talking to him about what it means to be a Christian. He starts presenting the gospel. To this guy and he's a he's a big dude pretty burly probably could smash me uh with his pinky like and he just sees the guy start tearing up and just starts crying at the good news that's available to him we live in this era of clickbait of a thousand different headlines and we don't we don't trust them we, we just have a general distrust because of all of that. But when it comes to the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, it's not news that you hear and you move on too quickly of what's next. This is the good news that the war has ended, that Jesus won. And it's news that should stop you in your tracks. It, it's one of those things that we should hear and we, we should feel relief and we should feel joy. I think about in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up by victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Or oh, death, where is your sting? And the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We should be excited when we hear that. We should be relieved. We should be joyful. And we should see that that applies to every sin, personal and, and global, that there is. Jesus has won the war. And I want to give you just a refresher. I want to give you a quick reminder. In fact, most of this message is going to be a reminder. But when the Bible talks about reminding us of something, it's not like you forgot it. But we're, when we're reminded of something, when we remember it, it's that we're giving it new weight in our lives. So there are truths that you know. If I told you, asked you, what is the gospel, you probably know it. The question is not do you know it, but what weight have you given it in your life to the things that you face every single day, to the news that you receive? Because it should, it should change all of that. And, and this is how the war ended. Jesus came down from heaven. He was in heaven, and he humbled himself and took, uh, took the form of man, and he lived this blameless life here on earth. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God who knew no sin lived a perfect life, but then took on sin on the cross, so that we could know God. <laughs> Jesus died on the cross in place of us, paying our sin. He didn't deserve it. I love the quote. Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we could never pay. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own, own love for us, that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans, I already said that. And then, and then just kicker, he rose from the dead. He didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead, and that's the first fruits. That's the first fruits of the promised renewed world, which is a weird thing to say. What do you mean by that? Jesus is resurrecting from the dead. Not only gives credibility to everything that he did. Not only is it the proof, like, all right, not only did he pay the price for our sin, but then he proved that he did that by raising from the dead. But then because of his resurrection, we know that we have an inheritance on, in the future resurrection that is to come. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, Now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. 
For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So we can have hope that the sin that began in the garden was conquered on the cross. We can have hope in Jesus Christ and in his resurrection. The power of Jesus' death and resurrection is greater than any sin in you and also in the cross and in, in, in the Middle East. Jesus' resurrection and the gospel of Jesus Christ should give us hope in all of that. How do we respond to this good news? How do we allow the, the gospel? It, it's not just how we see ourselves. But the gospel, it is how we see everything else. It's how we see what's happening in the Middle East. We see that there's a breakdown over there because they do not know Jesus and his redemption. And they are fueled by something else. It's how we see what's happening here in, in East County where we see that there's a lack of stewardship, there's a lack of responsibility, there's a lack of, of of understanding God's way and walking it out. And it's, it's a response, it's how we see our lives. Are you currently seeing the world through the lens of the gospel? And if not, then what? Whatever conflict you're facing in your families, in your workplace, internally, with your future, with your aspirations, if, if all of these things are not being seen in light of who Jesus is and what he's done and how we've responded to him, responded to him then what are we using? What filter do we have to see those things? Is it our, our pride? Is it our own aspirations? Is it, I, I feel like that in itself, if, if there's any question that you take away from tonight, that's worth asking. Because our God is good, He is holy. Exodus 24 describes, or 34 describes in this way. It says, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And yet, he will, no, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. How do those two things add up? If I was a speech writer or something like I, I guess technically I am, but I, that last phrase, I might like, oh, there should be some transitional sentence there. There should be something else. And yet, it, in God's compassion, in his graciousness, in all of that, he is also just. And so he, he's not going to just ignore or leave the guilty unpunished. Sin is the opposite of that compassion. It says, Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. That's the whole goal of sin. So God wants to move. Mark says this, he is an uh, eager redeemer, eager savior, and a reluctant judge. Sin wants to destroy. But Christ came to make a way for those who have sinned to come to know God and be com in communion with him who's perfect and holy. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have that opportunity because of what Jesus did. And finally, faith is this. 
faith is us. You can go to the next one. Saying, if, if we confess with our sins, or there we go. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I think that's the most basic understanding of how to be saved there is. It's because of that, that order right there. God's good, sin bad. Jesus made a way for us to know God even though we, we have sinned. We have to have faith in him. It's because of that that we can, as, as it says in Ephesians 2, it says we were formerly known as children of darkness. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, such were some of you when describing sin. And I want us to have this hope when we see sin, that, that puts it in its place because we have this understanding in how we know God and how he has transformed us. The gospel is where we find all our hope. And the gospel and the transformation that we have come to know should fuel us, should give us Great hope for every other issue that we see in our culture, that we face or that we hear about in the news. The gospel is good news for you. The gospel is good news for our world. All of it. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Right now, our world is full of, of just that which is lost. And to that, I don't want you to be a person who responds by running to the hills, as fun as part of that seems. I don't want you to be the person that responds by just ignoring it. I don't want you to be the person that writes it off as all is lost. And just you, you just, I'm going to live whatever life I want to live because we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Anyway. I don't want any of that. I want you to be the person that sees that which is lost and immediately think, man, this is what my Savior came to save. And for you to have hope. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of, is at hand. And the gospel is not just that you would be saved and then you're, you're done. You did what you're supposed to do. Now you just sit in an incubator until Jesus comes back or until you die. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that you would be saved and then you would go out and be God's hands and feet and help others come to know what you have come to know. The gospel is that you would be saved and then you go expand the boundaries of the kingdom. The gospel is that you would be saved and then you would enter into the kingdom. The kingdom is wherever the gospel has been heard and received and people are living it out. And what we want to see here at Foothills, what, what I want to see here in young adults is the gospel being expanded in our world, in our communities. But we can only do that when we have hope to see that done, right? When we have hope that Jesus Christ can accomplish that in our community that he has done in our hearts. And I'm wondering, I'm hoping that you have experienced that in your heart. And then I'm hoping that he has so transformed you that he gives you hope for everything else that's around you. How do we respond to the hell that we're seeing in the Middle East? Or to the, the complete depravity and loss, uh, loss, I don't even know how to say it, lostness uh, that's out there on the streets and the homelessness and all of that. We respond First and foremost, I, I think we're, we're called to pray, we, we get involved, we donate, all of that. But before all of that, take a step back, and I hope the first thing you do is your heart has hope that those situations, those people, that whatever it is, can be changed by the power of Jesus Christ. Because you have come to experience that in your heart. The war is over. And our job is to get the word out and to believe it ourselves and not to lose, up, lose hope when the evil flares up here or there because that's evil and it's death to us. It's on its way out. 
but we must believe in the gospel. I want to read a, a quick passage, and I, I'm just going to take a couple more minutes more than a wrap it up. Paul in Acts 19 goes into, um, in fact, I want to get this. He, he goes into this evil city. I believe it's Ephesus. Now, I should have double checked that. But it says in verse 11, Acts 19, verse 11, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and evil spirits went out. And many also of those, this is verse 18 now, I'm skipped way ahead. Many also of those who believed kept coming, confessing, disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of of silver. So this is the picture we're getting. Paul brings the gospel into this evil Roman city where people are practicing uh, m magic and where prostitutes, the, the way the city works is there were thousands of prostitutes that were employed by the city to go and, and encourage people to worship the false gods by sleeping with them. That's the city that Paul enters into. Why did he enter into that city? Because he had hope that the gospel of Jesus Christ could change it. And then what is he seeing? He's seeing a revival happen. To the point where all these people are throwing in a giant bonfire what they were using to practice these wicked deeds. They were disrupting how they made a living because they knew it didn't honor God. And it goes on and it says, So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Verse 21, now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must also see, see Rome. But before he left, it says, having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there occurred no small disturbances concerning the way. I'm almost done. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. And these he gathered together with the workmen of sil similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. But you've seen here, not only in Ephesus, but also in all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable amount of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at it's a big passage. Here's what we're seeing. Paul goes into a wicked city because he believed the gospel had a power to change it. And then in doing the work that the Lord called him to do, the power of the gospel transformed that city to such a degree that the people who were making the false idols were running out of business. They didn't have enough work. Because too many people were converting to Christianity. And, and so they conspired and, and they were working to get, to, to throw Paul out. What businesses do we need to shut down here in East County? And do we have the hope that the gospel of Jesus Christ can do? Or do we see... The, the dispensaries or the, the Planned Parenthoods or whatever it is. I mean, just do we see those things as enemies of, the God, of, of God, but also as opportunities where in this culture, in this darkness, our light has the power to come and transform and change? Or are we without hope? band can come up, that we may be a people who know and have experienced the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way that we live with hope, that we live with assurance that the, the change that we have experienced, we can see in those around us and in the, the different businesses 
and stanchions of, of wickedness. We can see those change because the power of Jesus Christ is not too short, too small to save, to transform. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this, just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. We live in times where there's depravity and wickedness and evil almost wherever we look. But our God is good, and greater is he than that dark than the evil in this world. May we know that and have great hope and lean into that. Will you guys bow your heads? That's good. Jesus, I want to first begin by praying for those who, who have not experienced that. I thank you, God, that you did not just come for the individual that you came for, for communities and for cities and for countries. But God, I thank you that you did come for the individual. That we can personally know you. And so, if anyone here tonight is afraid finding themselves without hope because they have not come to know the saving grace that you offer. Lord, I pray that you would lead them to get prayer tonight. May they lay down their lives at your feet and trust you. God, I pray for those in you who are just discouraged or without hope. They see what what is going on, and it, it may even just have to do with the housing market or the gas prices or, or whatever it is, and they are without hope. Lord, may you encourage them. I thank you that it says in Isaiah, to the increase of your government, there will be no end. Lord, you will have victory. May we have hope, and may we have faith, even if it is a victory that we currently don't see. You are an incredible God. And we love you. Help us to give weight to what you've done, to who you are. 